Well, I want to turn this evening with you to Psalm 37 and the first section of the psalm that runs from verse 1 and we'll go down as far as verse 8. Psalm 37, verses 1 to 8. Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. For they shall soon be cut down like the grass, and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord, and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. And he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light, and thy judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord, and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth to wicked devices to pass. Cease from anger, and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. If you look at verses 1 and 2, you have David speaking of a time when there are many evildoers, many workers of iniquity. And he says in verse 1, Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. So he knew what it was to live in times that were troubled by evildoers, or as he puts it later in the verse, workers of iniquity. We can look around at the world today and we can see all kinds of evil that is done and all kinds of iniquity abounding around us. We see criminal activity, has ever been the case. We see blasphemy on every hand and it's getting more rampant in our day than certainly than I can remember in earlier years of my own life. People are so brazen with it these days. We see evidence of rebellion. That's not a new thing. Young people rebelling against traditions, older people and all the rest of it. And very often you find that people do something very different from how it's always been done, not because it's any better than the way that it's been done in the past, but simply because it's different. They want to stand out. They want to be, follow an alternative way of life. They don't want to follow the pattern laid down for them. We see what's known these days as antisocial behaviour. We hear of the injustice of the legal system, even in England. We hear of corruption in high places. We see deceit. And often we're on the receiving end of malice on a very personal kind of level. And often when you see all of this, or experience all of this going on around, it seems very often that people seem to get away with it in a worldly way, but God doesn't seem to step in and act. And people also seem to prosper by it. And when that happens, of course, it becomes the norm of life and what once would have been a shock to people is now the accepted pattern of living. Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity, those that seem to prosper by bad ways and bad lives. And looking on at all of these things, we do tend to fret, and we might tend to become envious. To fret means to become upset or agitated, or in the Hebrew, literally, even angry at what's going on, because they get away with things and even prosper through them. We might become envious because in all of their carelessness and their recklessness, they nevertheless seem to have smooth lives and they prosper by the behaviour that they engage in. Whereas, as a Christian person, you seek to live by the law of God, pleasing unto God, and very often we think and feel that things are against us and things aren't working out our way. And we would rather have the, the easy, smooth life that the ungodly seem to have. 
all too often. And we get fretful, we become agitated, especially if it's all beyond our control. What we know, of course, is that all workers of iniquity, all evildoers, as the psalm puts it in verse 2, shall come into the judgment of God. They shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. And we know, without any question, that a judgment day is coming because every person ever born into the world will stand before the judgment throne of God. And those that have pursued an ungodly life without turning to God, without faith in Christ, without cares over their soul, without a concern for what God says, promises or warns of, they will face a most dreadful, unspeakably dreadful, in eternity. Now we know all of that. We know that in the end, everything will be put right, so to speak. The balance will be restored. The godly, on account, not because of themselves, but because of Christ, and faith in Christ, the godly will be taken into a heaven that they never deserved, but it will be a heaven that is rightfully given to those that have been given it on the grounds of their faith in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. We know that. And we also know that those who seem to prosper in their sins in this world will meet, if I can put it in worldly terms, they'll meet their comeuppance, they will receive the judgment of God that will most certainly come upon them. And when all of that comes to pass at that great last day, everything will be set right. The godly will be blessed in heaven and the ungodly, the wicked, the unbeliever will be cast into the hell that God deems they are deserving of. Now we know all of that. But nevertheless, we live in a world where we are confronted constantly by evildoers and workers of iniquity. And it can be a hard thing to face that. It can be a hard thing to know what to make of it and how to react to it, what to think about it. In recent weeks we've had so much that has startled, rocked our nation with terrorist attacks first on London Bridge and then up there in Manchester and then at, uh, at Westminster and, and so on and so forth and of course there's been this awful tragic fire where dozens and dozens of people have been killed and it appears to have been because of um, negligence in the way that the building was renovated and things that were done in, in that sense. We, 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 we see all of this and um, it's an outbreak of evil on the, on the part of somebody, somewhere. And what do we do? How do we think? Well, we think to ourselves, well, God knows, God's in command, God will bring his judgment in the end, and we know that all things will be done righteously and according to his strict justice. We know that. But in the meantime, we ourselves can be, kept, can be caught up in this sort of slipstream of anger, and, and bitterness and rage and upset at the very fact that all of these things seem to go on and they go on without being stopped and if anything they increase rather than decrease. What does the Bible tell us to make of all of this? How should a Christian live in the midst of a world of that sort? Well there are clues here in Psalm 37, I suggest to you. Here's the backdrop. Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. And if I was daring enough, I would put before the beginning of verse 3 the word meanwhile. Meanwhile. This is how you're to think and this is how you're to live. And in the verses that follow, and I'm just going to look at them briefly, it's a hot night and I know concentration is difficult in hot weather, more so than in ordinary temperatures. But there are four, four 
items of counsel or advice, if you like, followed by promises. Four items of counsel and four items of promises. And this, I think, is how a Christian is meant to live in the world that we live in when we regard all of the evil and the upset and the distress that goes on around us. Verse 3, to begin with. Trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Here's the counsel then. Trust in the Lord and do good. Well, you look at all the things that are going on around you, you see the evildoers, you see the workers of iniquity, but what about you? What about us? What should we be doing? Well, trust in the Lord, that's the first thing, that's the underlying um, basis of everything else. Trust in the Lord, for what? For whom? First of all, regarding the evildoers. Don't doubt God's purposes, don't question God's rule, and God's final justice and his wisdom. It's like being in a ship or, if you like, in an aircraft and uh, you, you see a storm all around you. When I flew to Peru a couple of years ago, flying somewhere over South America, I can't be precise, I don't know where it was, somewhere over, <coughs> over Central America, I should say. Off in the distance there, there was this dreadful looking lightning storm going on. And uh, you, you look at all of that, and I don't like lightning at the best of times, much less when I'm 35,000 feet up in the air. But you look at all of this, and you think to yourself, well, it's all right. It's over there, it's not over here. And you remind yourself that every aircraft, every commercial aircraft, has got weather radar there in the, in the nose of the aircraft. And, th and they know what's coming, they know what's around. And the captain of the aircraft he knows what to do, and if there's a storm in, 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 in the flight path, he just, they just fly around it, or they fly over it, or they fly under it. And it's not for me to worry about these things. He knows what he's doing. What can I do? And we look at all the storms that are going around us in the world, and what can we do? But God is in command. He knows what he's doing. He knows his purposes. We may not understand it all but he's in control of everything. And we must never question that. We fret if we think that it depends on us. Or we fret if we think that everything's got out of control. But as soon as we remember that God is in command of everything, that fretting begins to disappear because we trust in the Lord concerning all of this that is going on around us. It doesn't mean to say, of course, that it's pleasant to watch or that it is an enjoyable thing to think of evildoers being cut down on the one hand or being allowed to progress with their evil ways on the other hand. But God is in command of it all. All things operate by his permission. The captain of the aircraft is in control trust in the Lord concerning the evildoers and for ourselves. If we get mixed up in these things, our trials are known to him. And if we seek to be faithful unto him, that's recognised by him. He knows. And we must trust in the Lord as well for our own lives. In the midst of it all, we have to get on with our own lives. We have to live as Christian people in this world. And so the psalmist says, trust in the Lord and do good. They might be doing what they're doing. Let God take care of them. You do what is good. You follow the will of your Heavenly Father. Maintain your Christian life. Don't swerve from your duty before God. Don't let trouble around you distract you or deter you. It's like a, a crew member in a ship and the crew member is worrying about what direction the ship is taken. And uh, are we going the right way? Are we following the right course? Well, let the captain worry about that. The man on the bridge, you get on with your duties down below deck. And that's how it is with us. Let God determine his will. Trust him for that. 
And in the meantime, get on with that, that which you know he wants you to be doing. Living the life of a true Christian here in this world. Now well, there's counsel I suggest to you and here's the promise that is given. Trust in the Lord and do good, so shalt thou dwell in the land and verily thou shalt be fed. Dwelling in the land, being fed, makes you think of Israel going into Canaan. They went there through all kinds of troubles and problems on the way but they got there. And they were fed, they were provided for, they got to a land of peace. And so shall we, that land of milk and honey, a land of peace and contentment. And God has a way of giving us peace now as we trust in him. And certainly there will be that peace to come in eternity. The counsel and the promise. And then in verse 4, another piece of counsel and another promise that comes with it. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Do we delight in God? Do we take pleasure in what God is and how God works and what God does? Joy and delight in the Lord is a prominent feature of Christian life and experience. Circumstances, feelings may vary, we know, and our degree of a sense of delight may vary with them. But God is always the same, and if we can cultivate this delight in the Lord, it honours him, and it does us much good. To delight then in what God is, what he is in himself, what he is like, what he has been, what he has been to us personally, what he has done and what he has done for us personally. The psalmist in Psalm 126 says the well-known phrase, the Lord has done great things for us, whereof we are glad. Are we glad because God is what he is? And we are glad because God has acted toward us as he has acted? Delight thyself in the Lord. Seek pleasure in God. Give up looking for pleasure and satisfaction in the world around, or the world offers many good things to enjoy. But if only we would give more time to the Lord, more time to his word, more time to devotions, we would find ourselves delighting a great deal more in him. And there's a promise. Delight thyself in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Does that mean to say that whatever we want, God will give us? Well, I hope not, because if everything we ever wanted was given to us, the old black check, blank check illustration, it would ruin us very, very quickly. God loves us too well, too deeply, to give us whatever we want on demand. No loving parent gives his child or her child everything that that child demands. It would be the ruination of the child. The child will be spoiled. And God will not allow his children so to be spoiled. It would be tantamount to dictating to God, to use up in God's throne. I will rule the world. I will rule my life. I will simply come to God, demand what I want, and expect God to give it to us, because in this verse he promises to give me whatever I want. That's how we might read it if we're superficial and foolish. No, it doesn't mean that. You have to put these two things together. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Now, if you think about a very worldly person, a person who loves material things, physical pleasures, all of that sort of stuff, a person who just wants to sail through life with no troubles, no worries, nothing like that, Well, such a person will be asking for material things, physical things, things that will satisfy and please in a worldly, short-lived kind of way. But if you have a person who delights in God, what God is, how God works, what God promises, what God deems to be best, how that God's wisdom operates, glad of that, 
glad that God leads and guides his people. When we delight ourselves in the Lord, the whole thrust of what we want and what we pray for becomes very different. It's coloured, it's shaped, it's reformed after the will of God. And so what we find ourselves praying for is not selfish things, not worldly things, not materialistic things, not things that will please us in the short term and swiftly get us out of our troubles and all the rest of it. We will be praying according to the will and the pattern of God. You remember part of the Lord's Prayer so-called, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thy will, not our will, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And the passage that we read from 1 John 5, this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us, not our will. Be very thankful that God doesn't always say yes to your prayers. Because when he doesn't say yes to your prayers, He's going to do something that is far greater and far better than you would ever dream to ask for. As one has said, it's often quoted, if God doesn't give us what we ask for, God gives us what we should have asked for and would have asked for if only we had known what he knows. Delight thyself also in the Lord and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Verses 5 and 6. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. And he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light, and thy judgment as the noonday. To commit, in the Hebrew literally, is to roll. To roll across unto God. Well, what? The way, our way, our lives. I would put it like this, to transfer to God responsibility for making decisions in life and for determining our purpose in life. You see, again, in all the midst of everything that's going on in the world, the things that upset us and trouble us, all the evil doers getting their way, all the tragedy that strikes and all the rest of it, in the midst of all of that, we've got to remember our lives and our lives before God. We mustn't get so worked up like the world does that we forget that we have a God to serve and a purpose to fulfill. Commit thy way unto the Lord, your life, your future, the decisions you have to make, the purpose that you have. Don't hold it to yourself as though you must make the decisions, you must make the choice, and that God has no part in that. God has got every part in it. And when we transfer responsibility to the Lord and trust him for it, life becomes a whole different thing. It becomes lived on a higher plane and becomes more fruitful, more blessed. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him and he shall bring it to pass. You see, his choice, his purposes. If we hold on to our own will and determine to live life as we want to live it, we often find that our purposes are frustrated. God's purposes are never frustrated. We might find that our purposes and our decisions turn out to be very, very disappointing if they do work out at all. But God's don't. God's never disappoint us. They always prove to be right. And here's another side of the promise. He shall bring forth thy righteousness, verse 6, as the light and thy judgment as the noonday. See, this is contrasting what's going to happen to the evildoers and the workers of iniquity. They think they're doing the right thing. They think they're living the best life by ignoring God and forsaking him altogether and living as they determine to do. They're going to be proved to be very, very wrong. And there are the righteous seeking to live for God and sometimes having a very hard time of it. But in the end, their righteousness, the rightness of their lives, the rightness of their decision, if you like, to roll responsibility for life over to the Lord, or they're going to be vindicated. 
It was the right thing to do to trust in God. It's always the right thing to do to trust in God. It's always the right thing to commit our ways unto the Lord and trust him to lead us. It's always proved to be the right thing. And it's always proved to be the wrong thing and a pathway to disaster if we think that we know better than the Lord does. God will approve those people that seek his face and desire to do his will. And finally, verses 7 and 8. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. Now I don't want to be unkind and I don't want to be unfeeling but with all that's been going on in this past week shock and sorrow and grief has turned to bitter, bitter anger because of what's happened. And it seems that the world thinks that that is the way to give vent to its feelings and the world seems to think that that is the way to solve the issue. Is it going to make them feel better? Is it going to accomplish anything in the end? Yes, wrongdoers must be brought to account, we don't deny that. Proper inquiries must be made and we don't deny that. Such things need to be averted, if at all possible, in the future, and we don't deny that. But to get so agitated, so angry, so eaten up, I just question what that's going to achieve. And what does the Word of God say? Rest in the Lord. I've known people over the years that have flared up with dreadful, dreadful anger about things that have happened. I remember being in a hospital once when a woman died from a heart attack and members of the family were almost rioting in the hospital because they believed that the hospital was responsible for the death of that person. And it was all getting out of control. Is that God's way? Is that the way of someone who knows a God of grace, a God of wisdom, a God who never makes mistakes? Isn't it better? Isn't it more honoring to God? Isn't it better for the soul to rest in the Lord? Now I'm not saying it can be an easy thing. Don't misunderstand me. I do know, I do understand. Been through things myself where things can get the upper hand and emotions can run very, very high. But the Lord's way is that we might be submissive unto him and rest in him. What a witness to an unbelieving world in dreadful agitation to show that there is a God in whom we can trust, a God who does all things well, and though things may be very difficult in this world, everything will be right in the end. Wait patiently for him. Patience is required in waiting for God's intervention and God's answer and God's time. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil, Though the world may act like that, the psalmist says, don't you do that. Don't you do that. You will betray your God. You will betray your trust in him. Anger that takes over and leads to words or actions that are wrong makes things worse that we've come later to bitterly regret. Wait patiently. Rest in the Lord. Wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in the way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Cease from anger 
and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. Waiting patiently for a God who will come. And at the end of this age, as I often say, God will be demonstrated and proved to be the God who did all things well. Otherwise he's not God. Otherwise it's a denial of everything that's true of him. God never makes a mistake. God is in complete and utter command of everything and in all times. And it's for us to trust in him. May God give us grace to do it. And may God give that calm trust to many in this world of just tremendous agitation and bitterness and anger. May it be so.